Well, hello and welcome to the Wednesday DC Today. I am uh, sitting here up at LAX. I'm boarding a plane any moment. So we're doing kind of a, a funky thing. I am actually recording before the market is closed, which I just did two days ago and said it was the first time I'd ever done it. Now I'm doing it two times in three days. But then I'll get on the plane when I'm done recording and we'll update the market closing data, which is only about 40 minutes away from as, as I'm sitting here recording. And so the written DC today will come all updated and buttoned up. And then I'm just sitting here recording without the luxury of knowing exactly how the day closed, um, which, of course, doesn't matter uh, in the grand scheme of things whatsoever. Uh, as I'm recording, the Dow is up over 300 points. S&P is up 1.4%. NASDAQ's up over 200 points at 1.8. So a big rally day here and what's been a pretty good week and what's been a pretty good recovery and what is uh, just kind of confusing um, a lot of people. And yet it does feel that some of the deeper anxieties undergirding the banking system have settled a little bit. I want to, um, I don't really want to talk much more about kind of exactly what's happening today. I'd like to do even less of that as we go. And each day, I usually am finding some different inspiration to talk to you about. Um, something came up in my morning research. For those of you who are newer to DC Today, um, or even those of you who are real familiar, but maybe just not aware, I, um, I read an awful lot of research every morning. And, and I tend to be a very early morning guy. And that early morning time is where I not only do a lot of the writing that I do, but um, a significant amount of reading and research. And there is um, a particular bulletin that I read every day. And just because I'm about to say something that can sound sort of critical of the analyst who wrote it, I'm not going to say um, what I'm referring to, but because it, it, it's an analyst I like a great deal at a firm I absolutely adore. But there's just a particular thing I want to pick on. And the line was that if the bulls are to reclaim uh, control of the market, then beta likely needs to reassert itself. And it occurred to me the flaw in this sentence, in this thought, is more than like, I mean, first of all, that isn't true if you're open to the idea that you could be bullish about something other than the market index. And if you are talking about the market index, then it's literally a tautology. Like that's basically the same thing as saying um, that, you know, well, uh, those bullish for beta are only going to get what they want if beta does well. And my analogy, as I'm often prone to do, is to turn it into a food thing and say, I am to eat ice cream I like if I can eat ice cream I like. That's what market beta is, is the... It is the return and risk correlation to the broad index, to the overall market. So it, it isolates you to that kind of um, systematic function of markets, the broad market index, and, and, and we capture it, measure it in a form of what we call beta, the portion of your return that comes from the overall market. And the, um, the, the critique I would have is that it is entirely possible to be agnostic about the market index and bullish about other things. And so to the extent that one is defining their market or investment or risk asset experience purely in the context of beta, then it is certainly true that if beta does well, then your beta experience will do well, right? I mean, it's obviously redundant. But I don't think that that is how investors ought to be thinking about the moment. Um, I believe that it would behoove people to have an investment strategy that is not dependent entirely on market beta. Now, market beta usually will lift all boats, like it, it, unless you're short the market, right? Um, unless you're reverse correlated or anti-correlated to the market. But risk assets, if you're having a high rally in market beta, generally it's lifting all risk on assets. And yet, I don't believe that in reverse that has to be true, that in a period where market beta is not ca uh, catching steam, that nothing else can be doing well. Um, and so, I don't know, I just, it inspired me to kind of highlight that distinction a little bit. 
Um, there was big news that had kind of broken last night, and then I got to read more about it this morning. And uh, again, Alibaba is a, a major tech and e-commerce name out of China, and them splitting into six different companies, and it's created this big rally in a lot of Chinese internet companies today and the Hong Kong index and so forth. And it may not be material to you or to us, but I bring it up for a macro reason that there has been a real downward pressure on risk premium of, uh, of Chinese uh, tech companies for some time out of fear of what the CCP could do about monopolistic concerns, where the CCP could exercise monopolistic abuse, and just an overall regulatory uh, framework that is concerning. And it just strikes me that something like this could very well be a tremendous unlock of shareholder value in a lot of these names while pacifying some of those concerns. And I'm not saying it to bring up a point about a particular company or a particular theme as much as the global macro implications for ourselves as emerging markets investors. Um, I think the results in the last 24 hours may have been massive to that company and that even the broader uh, Hong Kong exchange. But what it could mean for other markets, sectors, countries, and obviously certain particular companies is really meaningful if there's a path going here. And it's worth watching. I can assure you we intend to. And then finally, just an anecdotal issue that um, is on my mind. I, I believe you know Friday morning markets were down quite a bit. They came back. But there was a 300-point uh, downturn in futures in the morning and a bunch of talk about Deutsche Bank. Uh, largest, uh, best, both a merchant investment commercial bank in Germany. Uh, their CDS spreads have blown out. Credit default swaps, meaning what you have to pay to insure against a debt default, that that cost had gone up a lot, and obviously equity price had come down. And it kind of, it kind of uh, boiled over a little bit, settled down throughout the day, and a lot of mark, broad markets did as well. And there wasn't a lot of borrowing on European Central Bank swap lines over the weekend at all, which I think would have been a, a telltale sign of on, ongoing anxiety. I, it's entirely possible this was a weird 24-hour blip of a headline and concern. But it did get me thinking, though, that after the Credit Suisse incident falling into the not-so-loving arms of UBS in that Swiss National Bank orchestrated deal and the counterparty risks that exist there, um, I don't think the European banking system could, could handle a, a Deutsche Bank commotion right now. And I don't think world financial markets, I don't think U.S. counterparties and Wall Street would appreciate it very much. And so I just don't want to lose sight of the vulnerability that we live with. I talk all the time about geopolitical, monetary, and fiscal instabilities and vulnerabilities that are a part of investing experience right now. And this is another example Perhaps this one is fine, and I don't see anything imminent, eminent about Deutsche Bank's situation, but I bring it up to say that, that there are headline risks that could turn on us any time. Now, of course, that it would be true even if we didn't know about it. Most of the time when those things happen, we didn't know. But now this sort of having dang, dangled a carrot a little bit, I just... I'm surprised that the media has moved on so quickly. They generally like to make hay of something. And maybe that's a sign that there's really nothing there. But there's an asymmetrical reality here. There's not a lot of reward if nothing comes of it, but there's significant risk. And so whether it's that or whatever the next thing is, that's, that's kind of something we want to keep our eyes on. I wanted to mention it. Okay, so I can't give you closing data, but from the time I started talking to the time I ended, we're still up over 300 on the Dow. I'm going to go board a plane in a little bit. I'll, I'll finalize the uh, numbers of the day once I am airborne, uh, headed to Washington, D.C., where I speak at a big summit meeting tomorrow and have some meetings over the next two days. And I'm back in Southern California on Friday night, so a 48-hour trip to our nation's uh, capital. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening to. Thanks for watching. Thanks for reading the D.C. Today. Mm -hmm.